After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then, and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread, so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down, about five thousand in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with the fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. As we read the story, we are reminded of the vitality of food, the love behind sharing it, and the significance of choosing to dine with others. The miracle is the only one of Jesus' miracles, except for the resurrection, that is included in every one of the Gospels. It's a story that you've probably heard many times before, but despite its familiarity, there's a real danger that we miss what Jesus is actually teaching here. I want to quickly address two of the emphases that are very often drawn out of this remarkable story, and then we'll go to the deeper meaning of the feeding of the 5,000. So the first emphasis focuses on the fact that Jesus cared for the physical needs of those around him. We understand that in the same way that he invited his disciples to find a solution to the suffering before them, Christ also invites us to engage actively with a broken world and bring relief and comfort. This was an enormous part of Christ's ministry. He said, whoever gives a cup of water to anyone in my name gives it to me. If we were as concerned about what others had to eat, how would the societies we live in be transformed? This is true, but this is not the heart of the story. There is something more. The second emphasis focuses on the response of the young boy with his five loaves and two fish. Surely then, this story is a parable of how God will take what little you have and use it to bless many. This again reveals a truth about God. Again and again throughout the Old and New Testaments, God uses seemingly insignificant people. The young, the old, the weak, the poor, the uneducated, the sinful. Whatever little you think you have, God can use you to bless many. The widow's coin and the boy's packed lunch have incredible and eternal value in the sight of God. Again, this is true, but we mustn't stop here. If we stop here on these important applications, we might be tempted to think that the moral of the story is to try harder or be better. But this would not be good news, since no one can ever be perfect. So what then? To truly understand what is happening here, we need to look at the context and then ask two important questions. The first question, who is Jesus claiming to be? The second question, how should we respond? Who is Jesus claiming to be? Well, John gives us a big clue in chapter 6, verse 4. He explains that the time of Passover was approaching. It's no coincidence that John mentions this. The Passover was an important holiday for the Jewish people, and it centred around a highly symbolic meal. 
Do you remember the story of the first Passover? Many years before, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. Moses had returned to set his people free, but Pharaoh, we remember, did not take kindly to his request and increased the labor of the people. After a series of plagues, God commanded his people to prepare one last supper, a lamb, bitter herbs, and bread made without yeast. The blood of the lamb was spread on the doorposts of each believing household. This would protect them from the final plague, the death of the firstborn sons. And after this terrible climax, Pharaoh finally gave in and God's people were set free. This Passover meal was to be kept each year as an act of remembrance and taught to every generation. We must take careful note of this. The lamb, God's intervention, and the people's release from slavery. With this context firmly in our minds, let's return again to the Sea of Galilee with Jesus, his disciples, and the crowd on a hill. The crowd had traveled far to be there. They were hungry and tired. Jesus sees this and turns to Philip and asks, where are we to buy bread so that the people may eat? Clearly, Jesus did not expect his disciples to be able to solve this problem themselves, and that is exactly the point. Who would they turn to? Understanding the Passover story, we know that only God could intervene in a situation like this. Here, just like all those years ago, they needed to look to God to survive. The disciples' solution, a boy's packed lunch, five barley loaves and two fish, falls far short of what was needed. The disciples say it would take 200 denarii, and that's about eight months' wages. It's very clear that this was not humanly possible. But just look at what Jesus does next. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Miraculously, the crowd are fed and satisfied. Just like the Passover meal, the portions were exact according to the need of each person. The 12 baskets of leftovers serve as a reminder and a further clue, matching the number of tribes of Israel who had left Egypt, as well as the number of Jesus' closest disciples. So we see that there is something much more than the sharing of food happening here. This is no ordinary picnic. And in verse 15, we see it's not an election campaign either. Given the incredible power and symbolism that Jesus has displayed, the crowd's reaction is not surprising at all, especially considering that many Jewish people were desperately hoping for a Messiah to come and rescue them from the oppressive Roman occupation. Jesus seems the perfect choice to lead their uprising. So they hail Jesus as the prophet who has come into the world and plan to force him to be their leader. But just look at Jesus' reaction. He withdrew. He escaped the crowd, rejected their enthusiastic embraces to be by himself. Why? Why, given this opportunity to be adored and obeyed and potentially make a huge difference, why did Jesus walk away? Well, clearly... He was not there to solve political problems or get rich quickly. He was not there to provide a temporary solution and short-lived freedom. Something much greater was in motion. Then who is Jesus? In this moment in John 6, Jesus points back to the Passover meal, a time when God set his people free from slavery. A lamb was sacrificed and bread broken. This time, though, we don't see an immediate release from oppression. However, an unperceived victory beyond the crowd's imagining is only just around the corner. Remember how John the Baptist introduced Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 29. He said, The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is Jesus' true identity and purpose, to be a sacrifice 
Much more than keeping traditions then, Jesus' actions here are focused on his immediate future. Rather than simply pointing back to the first Passover, the first Passover points forward to Jesus' long-anticipated sacrifice for the sins of the world. The feeding of the 5,000 powerfully demonstrates the way in which God would intervene to save his people from the consequence of sin. Jesus himself makes this claim explicit just several verses on. It is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This life-giving bread, therefore, is a symbol of Christ himself, and he graciously gives himself to whoever comes to him. And so finally, question two, how are we to respond? Well, how would a starving person respond to the offer of free, unlimited food? As food brings relief, comfort, and ultimately life, Jesus presents himself as the means by which our desperate spiritual needs are completely satisfied. This is the heart of the story. Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples during the final supper. This was before he ascended another hill in front of another crowd, but this time to be put to death on the cross. Matthew 26 records, When he had given thanks, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples. Take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. At its most simple then, these meals are a beautiful illustration of God's grace to those who come to him. When we recognize our own helpless situation, we can remember God's provision. Like the hungry crowd who with gratitude took and ate the bread, Jesus asks us to accept his sacrifice, and then we can find full and immediate forgiveness. As much as we have need, it's offered to us. That and much more besides. <laughs>